When things aren't going right in your business, especially during this crazy time of change and recession and a pandemic, right? What do you do? Well, today I'm talking with best-selling author Mike Michalowicz about exactly what you should fix next in your business. Welcome to the Affiliate Guy podcast. If you want to grow your income, serve your tribe, and enjoy all the benefits of affiliate marketing and having your own affiliates, you're in the right place. Thanks for joining me today. Let's get started. Yeah, I think the biggest problem that entrepreneurs have uh, with their business is they don't know what their biggest problem actually is. You know, I, I know what it's like. I, every single issue seems super urgent, right? But there's no way you could possibly address all of the problems at once. And so the result is that you end up just continuing to go in this endless circle of, of putting out fires and you feel like a firefighter, right? And you, you end up prioritizing the wrong things. If you've ever had one of those days or weeks or even a month where you felt like you did a lot of stuff, but you, you actually didn't get anything done, you didn't really move the needle in your business, you didn't move the ball down the field, you didn't make the progress that you wanted to make, well, my guest today can help. Uh, Mike Michalowicz, he has a simple system to help you to get rid of the frustrations and, and get your business actually moving forward fast. If you don't know about Mike, I mean, Mike's, I mean, he's done everything he he teaches. We talked about that in the in the interview. He's he's been through struggles, he's been through successes, and he has devoted his life to helping other entrepreneurs. And so and what he figured out is that every business has a hierarchy of needs. We talk about that a little bit later. And if you simply fix the you know, first things first, and then the next thing, and then the next thing, your business is going to naturally level up. Uh, if you've not followed Mike, you haven't read his stuff or followed him at all, I'm going to tell you, like, the guy's funny. Uh, he's, he's, got, uh, he's got a great following. You know, he's honest, and he has, like, some deep, but actionable insights. And so I'm really excited for this interview. Now I'm going to re read you his official bio here just to give you some, some lowdown on him. Mike, now his last name is pronounced Michalowicz, and spell check always screws that up. Uh, he has launched and sold two multi-million dollar companies. He's the author of Profit, two of my favorite books, Profit First and Clockwork. He's also written The Pumpkin Plan and The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. He's got a new book called Fix This Next, which we're going to talk about in this interview, and I highly recommend it. He is the host of the Turning Points podcast. He's a massively popular speaker. I've, I've watched his TEDx talk. It's amazing. He's done a ton of other speeches as well, so go look him up on YouTube. Uh, he writes for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Entrepreneur Magazine, the Harvard Business Review, and more. So with that, now that you have the official introduction Let's learn what to fix next in our business with Mike Michalowicz. Well, Mike, welcome. Matt, it's a joy to be here. Thanks for having me. And so I am so excited to talk to you today, uh, especially right now. You know, for those of you listening way off into the future, you have a time machine or you have Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, for those of you, you know, watching this, listening way off in the future, we are recording this on about, what are we on, week 10 of, of the, you know, the lockdown slash, but we're reopening, but we're still in a recession and, and things are crazy. And so I want to start there, Mark. I want to start with acknowledging where we're at. Uh, right now as a, yeah. as a society and as an economy. This is a worldwide thing. This is not just the U.S. or just the South or just the Midwest or whatever. Um, so my first question for you, man, is, is like right now, how should small businesses respond to this particular recession and what's going on right now? Well, not by going into panic because that is <clears throat> the typical response. There is a mass psychological effect uh, that and it's just human nature. We're we're a herd animal, if you will. So, when when someone freezes up and does nothing, and someone else freezes up and does nothing, we all freeze up and go, like, "What's going on?" Uh, there's that classic example: is if someone stands in a city street and just points up, and you get a second person doing that, you'll actually build a crowd of people pointing up, not knowing what they're looking at. Mm. Well, freezing up or the panic response are the two most dangerous things. Just desperately doing things. Many people got, for example, PPP loans uh, because everyone else is. Yeah. And not really even considering why you need it in the first place. I'm not here to say a loan's a bad thing or a good thing, but it depends on how you're using your business. 
And uh, many people just went about it because ah, it's free money. At least that was the thought. Maybe, maybe it's not. There are some parameters around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bigger issue, though, is what? Why do you need that loan in the first place? That needs to be fixed. So um, don't panic. Uh, don't don't freeze up because everyone else is freezing up. Don't replicate. Simply really evaluate your business. Get real real about your numbers. Look at the data, not the emotion, and uh, make judgment based upon that. And I think what many businesses will find is it's not all over. Uh, some parts are over, and those must be jettisoned. But there's other things that are working, or with a modification could work really well. And yeah. those are the things we need to focus on. What, in your opinion, what does this make possible? Like this this situation, um, what is it making possible for you know solopreneurs and you yeah. know small businesses that maybe just wasn't possible like 11 weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's huge opportunity. So you can consider this a great recession or a great reinvention. So I think the first thing that's possible is just change the mindset. If we say it's a great recession, we will comply with that and say, yeah, look how I'm struggling. If we say this yeah. is a great reinvention, we'll say, how am I complying with that? And we'll seek ways to reinvent ourselves. So the opportunity is to reinvention. As a solopreneur or micro business, micro enterprise, the advantage we have is we can change on the dime. We can ask prospects and customers and past customers, what do you need now? And we can deliver on that immediately. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the big businesses that struggle because the big businesses have to go through their bureaucracy. You know, they're the tanker ships that are asked to turn on dime and they just can't. We're in little you know, jet boats and jet skis. We can spin and start bolting the other direction. Out of every recession, some of the greatest companies come out of those. So Microsoft, Apple, um, Google all came out of recessions and they all started off as micro companies. They had just an entrepreneur behind it was Steve Jobs or Sergey Brin or Sergey Brin or whatever. We can be that person. We have to do it by asking clients what they need now, adjusting immediately and rapidly to the new need and start accommodating it. And we can be part of the great reinvention. Hmm. I love that. I mean, it really all starts up here. It really, oh, it always does. Yeah. It always does. It, start, it starts there, but also it could be stopped there, right? Yeah. Most people, We'll sadly think, let it stop there, saying, when's it going to return to the normal? Why aren't things going back to normal? And won't adjust. And that's the problem. I think some people will elect saying, how do I leverage this situation? Where is the opportunity? What can I do to make this the greatest period of my entrepreneurial life? And those people, great questions get great answers. Yeah. Now that I know of, you are not a fortune teller. But um, you know what would have been wild, though? I'm not fortunate. It's been wild if you said, hey, we're recording this on January 1st, 2020. It's amazing right now. And we want to predict what the future beholds. And we I, both of us are feeling like a pandemic will set in <laughs> by March. <laughs> that would have been cool. You and I would both uh, get arrested for causing this thing. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. Or at least lambasted on social media. Yeah. Um, so being that you're not a fortune teller, though, I, I, want, I want to ask you a hard question. I'm just, you know, and there's no right or wrong answer, of course, to this. Like, um, for business in particular, is is there a normal? Like, I mean, is there, certainly we're not going back to what was normal, but right. like, how many new how many new normals do you think they're going to be over the next, say, 20 years for business? Yeah, so, so let's first define, at least my definition of normal. Normal is customer demand. And so if they return to a new normal, from the entrepreneurial perspective, it's, will customer demand be the same as it was leading up to this situation? Hmm. My expectation is, no, we won't return to the normal. We won't return to the same type of customer demand. But the demand will remain. It just shifts in the way it, it, it presents itself. People are going to ask for things in a new way. Hmm. So that's what I expect. The only way to find out what the new normal is then is by asking customers, because it's customer demand, how may I serve you now? How many times will this happen? Who knows? It will happen again. You know. I've studied now every recession going back to the Great Depression, 1929. There is a common pattern. There's a trigger event. So 1929, there was the move to the gold standard for currency, caused a crash on Wall Street, tri tricked off the or tripped off the Great Recession, the Great Depression, which already had a destabilized economy. It was just the event that made it kind of aware to everyone. Fast forward to more modern times, the 70s, the oil, OPEC oil crisis undermines a destabilized economy. Fast forward to modern times, you know, 20, 2000 was the uh, dot-com bubble, yeah. the, the terrorist attacks, 2008 was the housing collapse, now it's COVID. So there's a predictable 
um, triggered. There will be a destabilized economy like we have it now. Something happens, it becomes exposed, and then we all go into this recession. Consumer demand, consumer demand though, doesn't necessarily go away. It just stops being activated. So I consider it pent-up demand. Consumers are still out there. They may just be waiting to buy and waiting to buy in a new way. Hmm. As they go through, at a certain point, confidence gets uh, triggered again. They're like, okay, I want to buy stuff. And then demand skyrockets. The interesting thing is supply, us, the, the entrepreneurs, we start to go away because in a recession, there's some, some uh, your competition says, you know what, I can't do this any longer. Other ones that say, I'll try crazy things. And I do the wrong thing. So, you know, 20 or 30% of competition will wipe out because they don't respond appropriately. Our job in recession is to sustain and maintain, maybe even grow a little bit. But then when the day hits, when there's a surge in demand, now there's this massive gap that we can gobble up. We mm-hmm. have the position for that. I will tell you this. To do that, you have to start preparing today. You need to start recruiting today, which, by the way, is different than hiring. I'm not saying bring people on if you can't afford them. Start recruiting. Get the groundwork in place that when you need to hire because demand starts to spike, then you can bring those people on very quickly. Don't start the process then. Start seeking the technology. Don't engage it. Don't use it. But identify what will be the next level of performance for, for you through technology. Start lining it up. And then when the trigger happens for the surge, and who knows? It, it could be six more weeks. It could be a few months. It could be a few years. Yeah. But it will happen again. We need to be in the position to gobble it up. <clears throat> so I want to want to ask one more question on on where we're at right now, and then we'll, we'll start. I want to move to you know, actually where you've been, and then we'll move to the future. We're going to go like in kind of a weird. Yeah, I like that. I like that order. Um, there is no order. <laughs> so you mentioned something that you know, biz- small businesses are being exposed right now. Uh, and that's really what's happened over the last 10 weeks or so. I think it's obvious to see how restaurants were exposed. Yeah. You know, like, wow, they didn't have a plan for what would happen if people couldn't eat in their restaurants. Some of them did. Some of them didn't. Um, I think it's really easy to see how salons were exposed and yeah. whatnot. But like, let's say somebody's running, you know, our audience is primarily online businesses. They're primarily small, you know, small business owners. How were like just business in general, or perhaps, you know, you could focus on online businesses. How were they exposed? Uh, you know, back in late March through through now. Well, if you have a product, the infra- the shipping infrastructure has been exposed. So there's mm-hmm. something that we don't have control over has been exposed. Try shipping something. I, I try to send a gift to uh, a colleague of mine, and Crazy. now it's two and a half months in, and it still hasn't arrived. It's actually becoming an embarrassment. But I told him, hey, expect this gift, and part of it arrived, and the other part is just out there. So a small business. My perception as a consumer is this small business isn't delivering. I know it's not their fault, but they're the ones exposed because they're dependent upon this infrastructure. So I think one exposure you see playing out right now is dependency. A lot of these businesses became very good at something very narrow, but they didn't have any form of redundancy around them. They were so dependent upon others. And when others are failing, it's compromising their business. That's what I see there. You know, you see, like we're doing Zoom right now. Um, Zoom, the demand on Zoom has skyrocketed and Zoom starting to have technical problems. It's yeah. getting overloaded. God forbid you hop on at noon Eastern time or something, it's chances are the whole system's gonna fall apart or lock up. So we we see the exposure of the infrastructure that's not prepared. And this happens consistently. The the shipping industry was not prepared for people not shopping, but actually having everything delivered to their house. It wasn't prepared. The online infrastructure for virtual meetings was not prepared, and the infrastructure was getting exposed. That's normal. Whenever there's mass shift and all of a sudden everyone moves from the prior watering hole to the new watering hole, if the watering hole isn't adequate enough, it gets drained very quickly. So it, it, it happens, but it's still our problem as a small business owner. Hmm. That, that is true because I remember uh, we'll talk about this book here in a minute, but it took like 11 days for that to get here. And I have right? never known. Right. And that's my problem. No, and it, yeah. It, I, and I know what you're saying. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's the publisher, but uh, <laughs> you well, thank you. It thank never you. takes but, that long for a book, you know, like never. we're used you know, to. It's a, it's a day or two. Tuesday, and, you, you yeah. send book, you know, you order book. And then Thursday, you get book, and that's just the way the world operates in 2020. It's operated that way for, I don't know, for me, about eight years now. You know, like you, yeah. 48 hours is the longest you have to wait. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a good case of point. So I would define you, Mike. This is a question I'm just genuinely curious about here. This is for my own edification, I guess you could say. I would define you as, as like a, a small business guru. What would you call yourself? Not a guru. I, um, 
I, I, knew you, I, I know you don't like the term. That's yeah, I'm, I'm honored that you say that. And so please understand, I received that very respectfully and I, I'm honored. Uh, conversely, I've disdained for that term because that guru to me points to mastery. And mm-hmm. how I define myself is just a guy who's going through an entrepreneurial journey who's really devoted to finding certain solutions for himself. That's what I'm trying to do. And then sharing with other people. Cool. I have so much more to learn. Um, I would say I'm, I'm not, you know what the, the term I would prefer to be called? I'm an entrepreneurial student. I love the study of entrepreneurship, particularly small business. I just, there's something about, you know, that guy who has one hot dog stand and says, you know, what, I want to have five. Like, I'm like, that's awesome. Um, that person that says, you know, I have this dream of making this software. I have no idea how to go about it. It's a great idea, but I'm going to make this uh, a vision come true and I'm going to go all in on it. And they have no backing, no financial backing, but they're, they're going for it. I, I love the I love the businesses that's that are not envious and want to be the next Facebook or Google. They just want to be the next them. They want to find the right size business that mm. serves them. They want to change their community. Uh, they want to bring wealth to their family. Like those are the people. I just love that community, the, the underdog entrepreneur, and I I'm a student of that. So so I would call myself an entrepreneurial student. Okay, so I want to go back to your first book for a second. Was it the Pumpkin Plan? Was that the first? First one? book was actually called the Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. That's, oh, that that's right. That's I way that. back. That's what the way Gosh. back machine. Yeah. Okay, man. So I got I got I got to park there for a second. I don't. You you might not remember him because I know you have encountered approximately eight million people. Um, but my friend, actually former business partner, his name is Hunter Ingram. This was oh gosh, probably 2011, 2012. Mm-hmm. He he tweeted me, and he was like, "Dude, he he he's an EO, and he a rock um, and roll. He's friends with Cameron Harold, and somehow he I, he ended up in a very small room with you. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like you know you in a room with like three hundred people. There were probably like twelve people or fifteen people in this room. So of course that meant that you were friends. You know, I'm picking on him, <laughs> and um, he was like, "Dude, you got to check this guy out," and uh, and it was the toilet paper entrepreneur guy. And I remember thinking that's kind of like I, I like that from a marketing standpoint because it's weird, yeah. but what? And I remember yeah, checking yeah. that out. And uh, so I apologize. That was the first book. Was oh no, no, please the not. Second one then. Please, yeah, Pumpkin Plan was my second okay. book. So I want to go back to the toilet paper entrepreneur. You said something there. You said I'm I'm a student and I'm I'm really just documenting the journey. Yeah. Um, this is a question we get a lot from, from our members and our students. It's like, well, but I'm not an expert. I'm not a guru. So how do I write a book about that? How do I build a platform around that? What was that process like for you uh, building a platform and being um, at least perceived as a guru to people who were reading your material when you didn't feel like you were yourself at the time? Yeah. So we, we all, you know, the human journey is learning. So uh, no one starts off by knowing all. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we all have to learn how to drink out of a glass of water without spilling on ourselves as kids, and we all have to learn. Some of us something. are still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, me too. Occasionally, <laughs> um, particularly after a bourbon or two. But what I found is um, that it's a thirst for the knowledge that supersedes everything. So mm-hmm. here's an example: I'm working on a book right now around what makes people notice something and then decide to take action on it, to buy it or not. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I have thoughts and ideas, but I don't know. So I've, I research and I, I had to devote uh, a portion of my day every weekday where I exclusively do research and writing. And uh, I've been tackling this now for about in earnest for about six months um, and I, I've been researching the general concept for about three years, and I'm going to be writing about it now for about two years, maybe a year and a half. Um, it's really just a thirst for understanding something. The, the beautiful thing about a book is I don't think we need to purport or be the expert. We just need to be the journalist who finds the experts. Mm. Most of my books, uh, I share a little bits of my journey, but it doesn't mean I have the answers. I collectively find the answers from the real experts in the world accumulate it in a book and then deliver it. So that's digestible. That that's what I think an author does. Yeah. And I, and I love that. I actually love your writing style. Thank you. Um, it, uh, it's, 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 it's a rare combination. This is the part where I just, you know, totally blow smoke up your dress here. Um, the fact, you know, I wear dresses is impressive. <laughs> I mean, you know, we can only see the heads. So right, right. I, Thank God. Uh, I don't know if you have pants on at all. Well. Um, 
there are people who make me think, but it takes me 15 minutes to read three pages. Yeah. And, and that's fine. You know, yeah. I like to be able to think. And there are people that I can read 15 pages in three minutes. Yeah. I think I said that right. Uh, but they don't make me think. And this is kind of like, it's why I read about four pages in three minutes a year. It's not, I'm not <laughs> that slow, but you know, it makes me think as well. And I, and I want to give uh, commend you for that because that's a very rare talent. I'm, I guess I'm honored call. to receive that. That's my intention is I, you know, I, my commitment is to simplify the entrepreneurial journey. That's mm. the promise I make. And, uh, I write the way I speak. So it, yeah. if you can comprehend what we're talking about now, this is basically my level of writing. It's, there's no sophisticated words or anything like that. And, and the concepts for me, I, I need them to get to a really simple level. I, um, I struggle to understand complexity myself. So I remember once I like, talking with my accountant just for two minutes about what a balance sheet is. And I, I started throwing up my own mouth. It was like, <laughs> uh. but I, I really knew that I got to figure out how to be profitable. And I spent all this time simplifying, 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 and then I finally figured out, okay, here's what works for me. And then, you know, hopefully I can, I present it in a way that people can digest it and then replicate it. I love that. So I want to ask you about three or four more questions as we wrap up here, because I want to be respectful of your time. So you, you wrote the toilet paper entrepreneur, pumpkin plan, profit, I always forget the order. Was it profit first, then clockwork or vice versa? You don't know the order. I, oh, actually, I don't know the order. Because I, because I read them. I, well, I, well, you know, I, I've never read the pumpkin plant. So you should know the order. order. Yeah. Well, yeah, I take it back. You know, I'm an Uber fan of like Def Leppard. Like I know yeah. like every you know, single yeah. album. I can name the Counting Crows albums. In oh, okay. Yeah. So all I know is Mr. Jones, which wasn't probably even the name of the album, was no, it? August and everything after. August and everything. They just recently re-released with like the London Sim, Sim, or Phil Harris Symphony. Philharmonic, yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's amazing. They're a badass band. Yeah, they are. Um, I like the one they, they, they uh, took down the trees, put up a parking lot, put up a tree museum. Freaking genius. I mean, Joni, horrible representation was going Joni on. Joni Mitchell, I think, or whatever her name was. I think I so. Think so, um, <laughs> but the book, the book sequence, I think uh, Pumpkin Plan, was it Profit First? Now, I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was Profit yeah. First. Then well, I read Profit First Then Clockwork. That's yeah. why I don't know the order because yeah. – uh, Anyway, so you wrote those and then we come to, which by the way, those two books come up in, they will come up today in a mastermind I'm in. I guarantee awesome. you, somebody will reference one of those books. Oh, I love it. Um, it's, it's, I'll tell you, it's just so you know, Profit First, uh, Clockwork, and Rocket Fuel are like the three books that I, I love Rocket either, Fuel. I talk about on like a weekly basis or they, somebody mentions them to me. Like, have you read Rocket Fuel? Have you read Clockwork? You know, yeah. just letting you know, it's pretty cool. We have this new book now, Fix This Next. Uh, yeah. How did this book come about, especially after you know you had two you know, bestsellers before? Um, how did this book come about, Fix This Yeah, next? so th this one became, uh, it became very clear that the biggest challenge entrepreneurs have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. Mm. It's very clear that the vast majority of entrepreneurs are in fire extinguishing mode. Um, and if we grow our business a little bit, we simply become a fire chief that we're constantly putting out fires. We rush to address all the apparent issues and there's countless apparent issues without knowing what's the one most impactful thing our business needs from us. So I wrote Fix This Next to be a way to pinpoint the most vital need your business has from you. And by definition, there only be one. What's the most vital need the business has that you must service right now? That's, that's why I wrote the book. Mm. All right, so last question, because I, I want to I just want to tell people they got to get the book. Um, and like I said, it's an easy read, but it will make you think. So what I found myself doing is, you know, like rhinocerosing. That's just a new word I made up. I love my it. My way through like I don't even know what that means, but I love it. And then stopping and going, yeah. Ooh, okay, now I got to think. And then I'll do that with six or seven pages and then stop. So it's not like one of those really super heady books. If you guys have read super heady books that make you like, you have to use a, a dictionary to look up every <laughs> yeah. word. It's not one of those. You t it's totally an easy read. Um, but there's this concept in there that when I first saw it, until you explain it in the book, so I want you to explain this. You talk about, you, you literally just wrote a book, you know, a few years ago called Profit First. So when we're looking at this hierarchy that you talk about yeah. in a business based on Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, yeah. you would think that the first thing would be profit, profit but it's not. It's yeah. something different. So explain that, how that works, and then. Uh, you know, yeah. The, so, so I, explain that. that. Yeah. So I'll explain it super quick. So Maslow's hierarchy is a study of human needs 
and identified basically, not basically, all of humanity has the same needs structure. So when you peel back the skin of humanity, we're all the same. And we all need oxygen, physiological needs, satisfied before we concern ourselves with safety needs, uh, shelter over our head, protection from harm, all the way up to self-actualization. Well, I'm like, oh my gosh, all businesses, if you peel back the skin, all businesses are identical. You mean online business, you could be a brick and mortar pizza shop. It doesn't make a difference. The essence of it's the same. So I created the business hierarchy of needs. Foundationally, every business actually needs sales first because sales is the creation of cash. It brings in the oxygen for a business. No, no sales, your business is suffocating. Only once you have a degree of sales can you extract profit from it, so profit's above it. But people confuse it because they're like, Mike, the title's profit first. Doesn't profit always come first? <laughs> no, profit first doesn't mean profit always comes first. It means in the traditional formula of profit, that profit comes first. It's not sales minus expenses equals profit. So we've been told it's sales minus profit equals expenses. And in practice, yep. every time we have sales, we immediately extract a predetermined percentage of profit first, take that first, hide it away, and then we run our business off the remainder. So people has got, you know, based on the title, they thought profit is first and foremost. Yeah. No, it's just the first thing extracted as revenue flows in, but the source of revenue is sales. And as you go up this business hierarchy of needs and fix this next, the highest level is called legacy. There's five levels cumulatively. And the idea is all these elements play out in a business at all times automatically, just like you and I are breathing right now without thinking about it in Maslow's hierarchy. But only at one time do we need to focus on the thing that's most imp imperative in front of us. So the business hierarchy of, of needs is a way to pinpoint the next thing you must do in your business. Love it, Mike. Well, Mike, I know you need to run. I want to respect your yeah. time. So thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you, brother. And uh, guys, go get the book. I'll share a link here in just a moment. And uh, Mike, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Be well. So I hope you got as much out of that interview with Mike as I did. I took a couple of pages of notes just from that 24 or so minute interview. It's all about mindset, like he said right now. Everything's about mindset. That's where we always start. Um, is customer demand ever gonna be the same? No, it's going to change. It doesn't mean it's gonna go up or down. It just means it's going to be different. People are gonna ask for things in a new way. And they are. You know, and you want to build your business independent as much as possible on other people's infrastructures. It's one of the big things I got out of this interview. And so another thing was, you know, you don't have to be the expert, right? You can be learning and growing with your audience and share your journey along the way. Um, I highly encourage you to go get this book and learn more about this. We didn't have a ton of time to really dive into the book itself, but I'm going to tell you, it is absolutely amazing. You want to go get this book, Fix This Next by Mike McCallowitz. So just go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash fix this next. That will take you right there. mattmcwilliams.com forward slash fix this next. And I will see you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening today. Remember to check out all of our deep dives into affiliate marketing at theaffiliateguide.tv. And if you have a question, Ask it at asktheaffiliateguide.com. Who knows? Maybe you even be featured on an upcoming episode. And lastly, if you haven't yet, make sure to leave a rating and review wherever you're listening to this episode. See you soon.